This is Art Sense, a podcast focused on educating and informing listeners about the past, present, and future of art. I'm Craig Gould. On today's episode, I speak with artist Sarah Morris. Morris's films and paintings try to capture the way in which we conceptualize the physical space of locations, while trying to reconcile our imaginations in the reality of navigation. Her works are in the collections of nearly every major contemporary museum. In this coming year, we'll see major retrospectives in both Germany and Japan. And now, a parallax view of the art world with artist Sarah Morris. Just listening to you talk, it makes me wonder why Sarah Morris doesn't have a podcast. That's a great question. <laughs> Actually, I remember that Lawrence Wiener once told me, he, he came and heard, uh, we were all in Switzerland, and, um, and he always used to say that artists were like expensive luggage, you know, being shipped around uh, the world. I, obviously, that has changed a little bit. But anyway, after we did this series of talks, and I did my talk, he said, really, you should, he didn't say podcast. He said, you should have a TV show. Absolutely. <laughs> and I thought that was, I'm not sure if that was like a backhanded compliment, but I'll take it as a compliment. No, I mean, you know, and, and it's funny because I mean, I, I talk about this with people sometimes. But that, he was a great talker also. Oh, sure. And, you know, I w only wish I could have the bass in my voice that, uh, that Lawrence had, right? Yeah. But, yeah. uh, you know, and I the questioning. I, sure. Well, you know, uh, in my twenties, I love to stay up late every night and watch Charlie Rose. And I feel like you know that's kind of where I found a love for, for interviewing. And you know, that show doesn't exist anymore because he got canceled for obvious you know reasons. And yeah. but you know what? There's a slot there for somebody like you to have interesting conversations with people because there is. You know, you're you're the one <laughs> with is. the uh, the philosophy degree uh -huh. and the well traveled. Well, I could do that if, if I wasn't doing all the other things that I'm doing. So it's, it, 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 you know, as you must know, with preparing for stuff and getting stuff organized. I mean, if you've done 50 podcasts in a year, that's a lot like that. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I could only I mean, I I've done several films so far with people of interest that have sort of come up um peripherally with other films that I've done. So there's a, almost like a chain of filmmaking that in, in my mind, isn't just a visual investigation. It is also hundreds of conversations that go on around the making of a film, around the understanding and navigation of space that I always find really interesting. I don't record those conversations. In a few instances though, I have made them films. Um, which notably was like Robert Town film, which I made after I shot the Los Angeles film. Mm -hmm. And he was in, you know, and I realized I needed to have a conversation with him, um, which is a crazy story if you want to hear it. Absolutely. Um, uh, so basically in 2006, I was asked to do, well, for, for many years, I had been asked to do um, with... Uh, Public Art Fund, um, I had been asked to do a, uh, a projects anywhere I wanted in Manhattan. Tom Eccles was sort of asking me, and I really wanted to do a piece in the Seagram's building, although there was only one spot available, which is where that tapestry, the Picasso tapestry hung. And we, we couldn't get an answer about it. And we certainly, I would never have been able to do like a wall painting or an actual intervention on the architecture. Mm -hmm. And um, so finally I said Lever House because Lever House was like, mm -hmm. you know, out of, uh, there's something really wrong about Lever House, right? It has a plaza. Now they use it as a restaurant, but back then it was like, it was a plaza that you think should be an entrance to a subway. It's right. not, it should be a bar or a restaurant. It wasn't, you should be able to cross the block quickly, but you can't because <laughs> there's this like glass lobby. There's a number of sort of 
sort of frustrating aspects to that building, although it was the first public plaza in Manhattan, from what I understand. And, and then it became sort of code to make public space whenever you made uh, a skyscraper. But um, so as I was doing it, um, I came up with this idea to, to do one of the Los Angeles paintings called Robert Town, who had sort of he was almost like a ghost when I was making the film. He was in so many conversations that I would have that Robert Town would enter the conversations. And I was, uh, you know, I obviously was always a huge fan of Chinatown. I can't think of a better mm -hmm. film, really. And um, and the whole idea about Chinatown is a, is is a is a frame of mind uh, was was I think even a line in the film. Right, but. You know, I, I was always super interested in him. And then when I proposed to do this piece called Robert Town, which is, of course, a fictional name, you know, it's not even his real name. Uh, it, you know, he's a um, I think he's a uh, comes from a, a Russian Jewish background. And his name was, you know, his name is 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 was adopted. Uh, so when I said the piece was going to be called Robert Town, the person who was in charge of um, public art fund set at the time said, you're going to have to get it okayed by him, which I was like, that seems really ridiculous. I mean, it was almost <laughs> like a sort of litigious fantasy that he would say no and sue us. So anyway, I ended up calling Robert town to get his permission to title the piece on Lever House, Robert Town, and he said, "I'd rather be on the ceiling than the floor," and that was sort of the beginning of a conversation, which led to uh, uh, the making of the film, which I shot like a few months later. Uh, but it always struck me as sort of ironic to have this sort of fictional name called Robert Town in Manhattan on a building which sort of had produced. Uh, it was the headquarters for Lever House. I mean, Lever House was the headquarters of Lever, which was like a soap company. Sure. And obviously, Robert Town had had written the infamous shampoo film in the late seventies. Right. So I I had asked to do that. So like sometimes characters or people um, enter the films, and I never have like a, a direct conversation with them. In other cases there's many conversations with somebody about the making of a film and they're not an image, right? Like wh who becomes an image and what becomes an image is sort of, there's a, there's almost like an alchemical sort of process with how those decisions get made. But, but the conversations that go on sort of through the films and past them, you know, become sort of a matrix for how I sort of move around sure. and how I, who I'm talking to and how I'm thinking about my work. So you're bound to think about interconnectedness. I mean, even in the story that you're just talking about, Robert Town and Shampoo, I think I've heard you tell the story about how you were working on Los Angeles in 2004 and you're in Warren Beatty's office and he takes a call from uh, Robert Town. Yeah, that was in his library. Yeah, and I remember looking at uh, this photo of Hockney that was in his library. And then he got a call from Robert Town, and Robert Town was out of town, so to speak. Right. He wasn't in Los Angeles. Otherwise, he would have possibly been in the Los Angeles film, but he was out of town, and he was somehow in South Africa shooting a film. And I heard this, you know, like anybody from Los Angeles, they sort of like like to do this spectacle of their phone call. Um, <laughs> so I got to hear, you know, 20 minutes or 15 minutes of, you know, a one sided conversation about a very difficult film situation going on. I don't know whether it was an actor or an actress having an issue or whether it was a writer problem. But anyway, I, I sat in, I heard this whole conversation and I was very intrigued as to what was actually going wrong with Robert Town's film, you know? And then I realized at some point I, I have to treat Robert Town as an epilogue, you know, like Robert Town became this, 
sort of key to the history of Los Angeles and the key mm-hmm. to what would be better about Los Angeles if there were more people like him. Sure. You know? So almost a, almost a lens to look through? Yeah. And I mean, he tells, uh, he you know, he has so many interesting stories about, oh, everything from the history of, uh, you know, his own career, but all the various people who sort of created, you know, 70s filmmaking in Hollywood. And also, you know, he has very interesting stories about how con you know, he, he tells, he told me a story. I can't remember if it's in the, yeah, it is partially in the Robert town film. He tells me a story of how like Robert Evans sort of made his, you know, Robert Evans really made his career, you know, like the deal that Robert Evans gave him allowed him to write pretty much for the rest of his life uh, based on Chinatown alone, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, because basically Evans offered him a share of the movie, um, which was apparently unheard of at the time. So sometimes these also these economic things which are usually not talked about, certainly in the art world. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, they're fascinating because you also hear the history of an industry, like the history of, you know, how he, how he was operating history of Paramount and the history of like how that role came to be, which is basically like somebody being a script doctor, taking somebody else's material and, 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 and working it now obviously chinatown was written by town but you know he had already developed this career as like a fixer you know as somebody who could come into a situation and like clean it up and get it get the dialogue right get this scenario right and that sort of intrigued me and i and i sort of thought about that the role of the artist is not so dissimilar like what's needed you know you're oftentimes invited going back to Lawrence Wiener. You're oftentimes invited into a situation to sort of say something or do something. And you do have to think very seriously about context, about where you're operating, what's going on, what's, what's missing from this situation. Just to reset for my listeners, there is one question, you know, in terms of like context, I try to ask every artist, which is, you know, a hypothetical. If you were to sit down at a dinner next to someone who has never met you before and has no idea who Sarah Morris is, how would you describe okay. how would you, <laughs> how would you describe what you do, what it looks like to this person that is a complete stranger? Well, I guess I would say that I I, I guess I would say first of all that I was an artist and that I make films and paintings that um, somehow try to picture or capture the way in which we imagine space, the way in which we navigate space, the way in which we navigate cities and people, the way we handle our infrastructure, the way things sort of move, the way, you know, um, and when I say the way things move, I, I mean, even more nebulous things like power, the way power is configured, the way in which we fantasize about that, all of those things. You know, sometimes it's not the actual way of the way, for instance, if you look at early paintings of mine, whether they be HBO, Grace, building or the Revlon Corporation, they don't actually look like that, right? It's that that's mm-hmm. the way I want them to look. <laughs> They're the way I want to display, you know, those sort of signs, you know, and, and to almost like as an appropriation of space, you know, taking over those elements of, you know, parts of sort of the context we live in. Is that is that too long of an answer? No, no, it's it's never too long of an answer, Sarah. So your films, your paintings, they're very much tied to coordinates. They're tied to to mm-hmm. place. They're tied mm-hmm. to places. They're tied to times. Is there something in particular 
about specific dates and times that you find attractive? I mean, I, I am interested. I mean, I've always interested in the precision, the seeming in, in you know, the seeming precision of time, which of course we know that everything is connected, right? Like it, it, I definitely believe in like sort of duration, the, the idea of like duration, not, not specific moments of time. Cause I think it's impossible. Like if we took a specific moment in time, it's connected to the moment before the moment after it's con connected possibly to something a few years back. You know, like there's no way to isolate a specific moment in time. You can try to, but I do think the element of, you know, what, when I say, how do you navigate and how do you, how do I navigate? You know, I, I think about that a lot about my path through the city, my path period, you know, like I think about where my studios have been. I think about, sort of moving through time through history which now obviously is you know you can say when i say history you know history becomes art history right so you think about you sort of think about sort of all the conversations um that have happened and and what is sort of propelling you so sort of when i think about the calendar which is an interesting problem now especially with covid it's sort of like i don't know there was like i feel like there's become a crater that has happened in the calendar you know what i mean like mm -hmm. people have sort of lost some conception of hard time there's even more of this concept of duration and that's fascinating to me because that's something i think artists are quite aware of even without a global pandemic but i think the global pandemic uh, for sure exaggerated a lot of things and for sure it exaggerated this uh, idea of distraction and concentration and the sort of crazy in between space between the two right sure. like w what is it what is the state where you're not completely distracted nor are you completely concentrated and and this sort of pivot between these two states of being is sort of where a lot of people have been for sure. the last two years right but as an artist i think you're you're you know you're you're flicking in and out of sort of concentration and highly sort of uh relaxed moments right like it's it's not it's not just one state of affairs thank god <laughs> you know i mean you're just sort of moving moving about no, it, it's and it's really interesting. You know, you're talking about duration. It, it makes me think of our perception of time, because time is a constant, but our perception of time changes as we get older. But they 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 say, because when you're mm -hmm. when you're five years old, to to get to your sixth birthday, you know, you have to make it another twenty percent of your lifetime. But you know, sure. by the time you're in your fifties, it's only two percent. And so, like each year you know, our perception of, of how quickly time is passing is, uh, is changed. It's always been a really interesting concept to me because, you know, we're always told that time is such a constant. Well, everything is quite relational. I mean, you know, the sense of, uh, I mean, I love that Charles and Ray Ames film powers of 10 because mm -hmm. of that sort of issue of scale. You're talking about scale, a child's scale of, of, perceiving time you know and perceiving people even you know you, you might know only x amount of people when you're five you know many more people by the time you're 20 and and so on but in some ways i don't really know if there's any sort of like progression through these sort of um experiences because you know as i was thinking about it uh for instance, I was asked recently by another artist to find a photo of myself when I was five. And of course, I don't have it uh, with me. I'm going to have to go to get it, get it off my parents. But, you know, when I was five, I don't think, you know, I don't really think my personality was much different than it is now. Maybe my sense of scale was different, but mm -hmm. I'm not even sure about that. You know, I had very precise ideas about the city before I even got to the city. And when I say the city, I mean, New York city, mm -hmm. 
you know, it was clear to me that New York City was like a Mecca, you know, like, and that I was definitely going there. And I remember that very precisely the first time I went, which was, I was like less than three. So I don't know. I mean, it's, it's uh, how, how, how you perceive things is, is, I'm not sure if it's a constant or if it changes. I mean, it, for sure, uh, there's elements of both, right? Well, you know, that's something that st- strikes me sometimes also is that, you know, I think about places I lived 20 years ago that I haven't visited in 20 years. And in my mind, that place is still exactly the way I left it. Yeah. But but in, in it's just as real in my mind as, as if, you know, if that's the case. But I know that there's absolutely no way that it, it's exactly the same. And so our perception of, you know, of what these spaces are or is kind of tied to our memories in time. Philosophy is more your wheelhouse, right? Well, I mean, I didn't, uh, you know, I did study uh, some philosophy. Um, I studied mainly political philosophy, but um, I wouldn't say I'm an expert by any stretch. I, you know, I, I read a lot of books um and i i love reading i love i love reading other people's ideas and sort of comparing it to how i'm experiencing um those phenomenons whatever they are or whatever politically they are um i like political philosophy um but i like a lot i mean you know when i speak about duration i'm talking about bergson you know like that to me that i remember when i read those books, I was really like, that does, you know, the sort of understanding of time and of sort of inner language that happened around the turn of the century, 19, you know, sort of the fin de siècle, turn of the century, 1900, sort of right at the moment before things became industrialized, that's sort of interesting, the writing around that, that moment. And then what happened next, of course, you know, is a, is a, a sort of major, major revolution on the level of what we're probably experiencing now. So let me, let me ask you, in your opinion, would you consider your films documentaries? Definitely not. Definitely not. I'll, I, I never forget once I screened Los Angeles in Los Angeles, right? And I screened it in Los Angeles twice. Once was at uh, screening at Creative Artists Agency, which mm-hmm. is the talent agency in LA. And um, and then once uh, because it was, I think it was shown at UCLA and it was in the sort of running up to the Oscars. And I think the producer of the film and I put it as a as a possible short documentary. But, you know, I remember in the audience, in at the university anyway, there was somebody in the audience who was like, this isn't Los Angeles. And I remember thinking or saying, well, of course not. This is like uh, sort of, this is, this is the film industry, right? This mm-hmm. deals with sort of fiction. This deals with fantasy. This deals with the fact that most actors or actresses are out of work. This is not, you know, this is, this is about aspiration. Right. It's not about it's not. I mean, yes, it documents in the sense I shoot like documentary style. I don't use lights. I use real situations. If you want to call them coordinates, you could call them coordinates. I put myself into certain situations. I'm not necessarily creating them. That script is running through the Xerox machine. That actress is trying out for that role. That casting agent is doing his thing. You know, Brad Pitt is punching himself. You know, those are all things that were happening. You know, it's just I was I was there uh, to capture them, you know, and I placed myself in those situations. Of course, you know, you could argue that that changed what went down. But, you know, maybe in a few examples, it did change what happened uh, for the camera, so to speak. Mm-hmm. But in general, it's they're shot like documentaries. A lot of the shots are like documentaries or they're like um, B roll from some other film. You know, I mean, I remember when I first started making films, people thought 
that I had used other people's footage. And I was like, no, this is actually my footage of Chase Bank. This is my footage of, you know, Park Avenue. This is my footage of Penn Station at five o'clock. And, you know, the idea that somebody would capture these seemingly, you know, just the sort of transient nature of the movement of the city and these narrative things that you know are narratives, but you don't know the ending to the narrative, right? You just know that somebody's rushing from Penn Station out with a briefcase. Like you don't know exactly, you know, it's sort of frustrated narrative, if you will. But no, they're not documentaries. I don't, I don't really view them that way. You know, it, it makes me wonder whether they may be even more objective than some documentaries. Well, documentaries are fictional things, too. I mean, they can be because it's like you start out with a theory. Exactly. And then you sort of prove your theory by talking to somebody who you know has the key to uh, whatever you're trying to sort of learn from. I suppose you could look at as my films as documentary in the sense that they're sort of an exploration of a place. But they're probably more David Attenborough than they are documentaries, Mm -hmm. you know, in the sense that they're like, I look at things as like a habitat, right? And if you look at things as a habitat for everything, even a recipe or a diagram for a painting, if you think about, you know, if you think about the contacts and Rolodex of Creative Artists Agency, which, by the way, is a painting of mine that's at Museum of Modern Art, was collected by them. But if you think about, you know, the, the, the contacts and the sort of diagram of one of those agents' heads right. of like how they're operating and who they're trying to bring up and who they're trying to throttle and, and so on, you know, you might get to an image of my paintings. You might be able to sort of derive, derive some sort of a, 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 a process there. But that sort of uh, that that sort of navigation of like taking something up, taking something down, squelching something else, you know, is all sort of this compression that most people in our sort of current configuration of let's call it sort of late capitalism. That's what people are doing. That's, you know, CAA is just like an extreme example of that, right? And it's just in one field, but, but the sort of, you know, even, even the iCal, which I hate iCal so much. I, I mean, it's the bane of my existence looking at my iCal because it's like, it has a glitch in it. It repeats people's birthdays 5,000 right. times. Like, I don't know if I'm the only person this happens to, but anyway, it's like just the carving out of space of iCal is like, tells an entire story right right tells an entire i mean it is the doc it is a document right it becomes the history of the studio or the history of you know what i'm up to but on another level it's like it's not just the history of what i'm up to it's the history of how people are perceiving time and context do each of the films do you wind up having paintings that are kind of naturally created as physical responses to the films well it's not it's not that organized it's not that organized um the paintings uh you know even with midtown the paintings because midtown was the first film that i did the paintings started before the film continued after the film definitely certain buildings in the film appeared as titles of my paintings but so there is sort of a map in that regard but um it it's not linear it's not like the films come first and then comes the paintings or vice versa it's like everything's happening all at the same time and sometimes with big lags you know sure. um but no it's not it there it's not it's not so organized like that I mean, you really could say in a way that the films and the paintings, I mean, they are made by one person, but, you know, it could very well be the work of two different artists. It happens to not be, but it could be. 
you don't have to experience one to experience the other. You don't have to see them in order either. I mean, I don't like the idea of this sort of, I don't really like the idea of the black box of, of the way people have sort of shown film um, in art. I mean, I, I, I've been lucky enough to show the films in a lot of different spaces around the world. And um, sometimes we show them, you know, sometimes we do project them in a quote black box. It's like, I'm not so interested in that per se. I, I like the idea that you could capture a few moments, again, going back to this idea of distraction as opposed to concentration. I think you could, I think you could watch like 10 seconds of my Beijing film and get it. Mm -hmm. Right. It might be, you know, I might shoot in 200 locations, but like if you saw a few of them, you would probably be able to understand a certain temperature, which I'm trying to yield, you know, and this sort of flickering that goes on. But I don't think you have to um, I don't think you have to see it all as a whole. You know, there's different levels of like how I view the audience. Um, I think it's I think it's okay to to just see and or understand a fraction. I don't think you have to see the entire whole. Of course, I see the entire whole. Certain people see the entire whole, but you don't have to like that's not that's not a prerequisite. It's not like it's a mandate that you have to. Although it'd be fun to mandate that, but you don't have to. So in my imagination, you do a lot of research and you talk to a lot of people and you wind up creating like a shot list, this coordinate at this time, and then you show up and you shoot there. And something totally different could be happening, by the way. What I project, it could be something like I didn't expect, for instance, on the set of Mr. and Mrs. Smith, I didn't expect for Brad Pitt to punch it himself in the face a bunch of times i mean i heard they were having all types of problems on the set but i didn't expect him to do that i just showed up and that's what happened so you know you have to be sort of ready to capture sort of that anarchic moment and sometimes the moments are very staged and very intermediated by some other group and sometimes they're quite raw And actually, that's what's that's sort of interesting, those different sort of densities of like uh, actually having to deal with that, because it makes it very um, makes it really surprising right? because you don't know. Like another example of like when I was in Beijing, we got there very first night, you know, the producer who is quite a commercial producer um, who basically wasn't going to wasn't going to work for me, but then I somehow got the international Olympic committee to do it. And then as soon as I got all the permission, he was like, yes, I'm on it. Right. Like I'm, I'm going to work for you. And so I remember we went all out to dinner the first night in Beijing where I was incredibly jet lagged and somebody said, you know, Kissinger's around. He's like, he's, he's here for the opening ceremonies. And I immediately was like, well, we need to, we definitely need he needs to be on the shot list like now where could we get him where could we possibly get him and apparently he was giving a lecture we found out at the university of beijing and we went and we filmed him in this amazing uh, sort of auditorium with the chandelier i mean it looked like out of stranger things it was like <laughs> it was like kubrick mixed with stranger things it was like this chandelier with this incredible light. So it's like Dr. Strangelove. Sort of honeycomb structured ceiling. And then before he spoke, Jackie Chan was speaking. And I was like, I can't believe this. How on earth would they have Jackie Chan lined up with Henry Kissinger? And I thought, well, that was, that was quite apt. <laughs> you know, um, that's what I mean by being sort of surprised by how things are actually organized by others. I think there's a level of randomness, but maybe not. Maybe there's a whole story. I don't, uh, I'm sure there is a story for why Jackie Chan was in the lineup with Henry Kissinger, aside from some sense of irony on the part of whoever was organizing the speakers that day. But, you know, I'm sure there is a story about why, as to the why. Somebody had a logical reason for it, but it doesn't really matter what the logical reason is. Like, that doesn't interest me. 
it, and it just kind of goes back to to some of the points we've already discussed is that and when you're planning your your film mm-hmm. you, you're imagining the narrative based on what you anticipate being at those coordinates the the end product winds up being totally different somewhat somewhat but no i think i don't i don't think it ends up being that different than i have in my head i just think the little details are different like I don't know. I didn't know that that was going to happen. I didn't know that we were going to be shooting like, you know, the gym that we would get. So um, that we'd have such access to, for instance, the, the female gymnasts. Like, I didn't know that. I mean, I, I imagine that we would, but like, I didn't realize that we would get, you know, the balance beam screw ups of the top gymnasts of the world. Like, I didn't really think about that. I just sort of thought, I want to place, you know, I want to be, have full access and then we'll, we'll dissect the sort of lineup as, as we have energy and sort of time to do, because, you know, when you're shooting film, sort of like with anything, you know, time is money. So you're sort of, you have a certain window of time to do it. And it's almost like a game, you know, it's like you have only a certain amount of days to shoot your film. So you sort of prioritize what becomes the most yeah, what you have access to and what seems the most pertinent to the overall image of the film. You know, shift gears just a little bit. And, and that is, um, I ask you about the parallax view. I, you know, oh, yeah. I, I've heard you talk a little bit about this movie from 1974. I love that film. <laughs> and I, interesting story. I, you know, I grew up outside of Dallas and, you know, the Kennedy uh-huh. assassination is always kind of hanging and lingering in the air. When I was in high school, my U.S. history teacher actually showed the parallax view in our classroom. Well, that's pretty amazing. I know. I wish and, I had a history teacher like that. What does that film mean to you? I think that film means to me uh, several things. It, it means to me, uh, I mean, I like the idea that you would have this sort of recruiting operation that is this sort of entity that you don't know who they are and that you're doing a job which you don't really know how it fits into everything else right Mm -hmm. like when warren Beatty takes that test and is determined to pass the test with a certain sort of profile um he's not entirely sure he has a theory but it's he's not entirely sure how his work is going to be used like what he's actually being recruited for and I think um, I think there's an aspect to that in most in most of our roles, but it's certainly that in the role of the artist. But I I guess that's one aspect of it I like. The second as I like the idea of an anonymous entity sort of controlling stuff. I like the idea of that. And then the second thing I like the idea of the disruptor to that. Right? I like the person who infiltrates and gets recruited and has their own agenda, right? Which is the sort of Warren Beatty character. Um, I love that. I think there's something quite subversive about that. The idea that it has this background of 70s American politics and this, you know, of, of taking down progressive sort of characters or, or at least sort of like keeping them down Um, sort of changing, you know, the the whole idea of like the conspiracy um, is something that, you know, we're still grappling with today. Like there's no end to it. Right. Right. I mean, once you get on that and I'm not saying I'm conspiracy theorist, but I just like the idea that, um, that basically there are certain entities that are in power that um, are trying to somehow, activate um or use our sort of i don't know to somehow i guess i'm trying to say that i like the idea that they're somehow in the parallax view anyway you have an organization that's trying to sort of control political outcomes and specifically in that film and i guess i'm probably you know uh, a kid who witnessed you know, a president resigned. That was pretty major. I definitely saw my parents talking back to a television set or speaking about the news. 
Right. I remember them. I mean, I mean, I remember even hearing. I mean, there was a lot of that in my house anyway. Uh, like the, the idea of basically realizing um, the what was going on is not what actually is going on, right? That, mm-hmm. that actually there's there's sort of two soundtracks, right? There's the official soundtrack, and then there's the 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 other version. And so this idea of like basically things are not what they seem, or uh, sort of deconstructing things was seemed to be like a normal just seemed to be like a normal thing you know it's like as 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 normal as cutting the grass or you know having a calendar in your house do you think that influences your work i mean could could somebody objectively look at your films and say you know what is this a little bit about surveillance you know, especially, you know, when you think about some of your, your paintings are sort of, you know, satellite level, you know, imagery in, mm-hmm. in some ways, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. is is surveillance in there somewhere or is that just, you know, me filling in I'm gaps? I'm not sure if it's surveillance or voyeurism in, in any sort of like normal sense, probably more in a... Um, in a in a sort of uh, morph between sort of like Charles and Reims and Picabia, you know, like, I mean, I'm very interested in the machine. I'm very interested in the idea of fake industry. I'm interested in the idea of currencies and in these sort of flow patterns that sort of are sort of what's making things tick. Like how, how are these sort of, Aspect. And I'm not just talking about infrastructure, like mm-hmm. proper infrastructure, but like all all of these infrastructures, right? Or you know, I'm not sure if you would even call them infrastructure, but um, I think it does influence uh, the work. This this idea of like looking for the sort of structure of things, trying to figure out how are things organized and. And obviously with thinking about that, you're at the same time playing with like the idea that any type of planning of a society is bound to have some level of failure, right? I mean, Mm. there's just, there's just no way around it with the level of corruption and the level of sort of psych human psychology. Right. So I think there's an element probably going back to the parallax view where you just, understand that the social forces that are upon us are not what they seem. Um, And I think I probably had a pretty uh, good understanding that of that at a pretty early age, whether that makes me uh, anti-authoritarian, probably, (laughs) you know, whether that makes sort of one, I think you have to have, uh, you know, the thing about art that is the most interesting to me, aside from all the conversations and the people and the travel and all of this sort of vast, again, connections between all these places and people, is that there is this sort of constant sort of questioning of like what should have priority? What what does what is the sort of dominant culture? What is not the dominant culture? I mean, even if you're looking at very uh, artists that sort of dealt with the marginal or marginalization as, as a sort of concept in, in their work, like, and you could look at sort of, I don't know, Paul McCarthy's a perfect example of, Mm -hmm. of, of somebody who's taken that trope. I mean, that has a political side to it, obviously. And, and I, and I think that's the part, about art that I love is that sort of constant questioning of like how you can choose a, a, a thing, a theme and try to render it visual and have that conversation. Because ultimately I think art is conversations. It's impossible to avoid. Like that's what it's, that it generates that even if it's just in the mind of the viewer and very rarely is it just in the mind of the viewer, but even if it is just in the mind of the viewer, that's okay. 
you know, when I look at your your paintings, I think of this this website I go to sometimes f- that is focused around the visual representation of data called uh, Information is Beautiful. And I don't know if you've ever come across this, but you know, it's uh, I have not. It, you would you would probably love it. I I've I have a number of books by a a, a Yale professor named Edward Tufte who talks about designing around the visual representation of data. And it reminds me a lot of your work, but you know, I'm not always sure exactly what's the underpinning or what I don't know exactly. I'm not sure either. (laughs) I'm not sure either. I mean, basically I, I, you know, of course I I think about, uh, you know, the idea of, all the different types of visualization of data, even like right now, as I'm talking to you, I'm looking at a stop sign in mm-hmm. Long Island City, uh, stoplight, that is, um, you know, which is a brilliant, brilliant sort of, you know, invention that obviously has a middle ground, which is the yellow, which I love mm-hmm. <laughs> because that's the light you go through, right? But, um, you know, visualization of data is like everywhere from 7-Eleven to the stoplight to the subway codes that I'm looking at to trucks going by. I mean, you have, there's so many elements to it and we know how to, we actually are quite sophisticated in how we look at like even a Coke, you know, even a Coke can, like it's, it, it, it means something around the world and it doesn't necessarily just mean like, you know, a cold coke it's not like a an autonomous thing it's a it's a obviously it's a it's a piece of propaganda it ends up like a sign it ends up like a flag as does fedex right you know i mean all of these elements are sort of moving around and they're they're everywhere and yeah i'm looking i'm looking at things like that as i'm sort of working on the paintings i'm looking at everything from um how I may see something that I think could be done better. Um, Or it might be that I'm looking at like the scaffolding systems of Hong Kong or the matchbooks of Hong Kong, you know, like there's many, you know, it's, it's sort of a sliding compendium of things going into the paintings. It's a little bit like a sort of tornado and then it ends up very quiet, you know, but um there's a lot of i I mean i never really want to have too literal um or too linear a path to the actual rendering of whatever data i'm using but there's a lot of things that go into um sort of the perspective that i'm trying to trying to build the majority of your paintings look very structured Mm -hmm. and planned but i've heard you talk about improvisation and, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you know, and how people kind of underestimate how much improvisation you use. Does that imp- improv happen in the digital design or does it happen at the point of execution? Well, nowadays, I uh, and for quite a long time, I've, I've always worked on the computer and the paintings are designed on the computer. But and I do my best to sort of work with paint live And that means that like, even if I have a painting laid out, planned out, and we're rendering it like on the canvas, I will still make a number of changes, even at, even as it's quote done. And that's, that's, that's gone on for quite a while. Um, So it's not like, you know, the computer can solve all problems to do with scale and, that you can plan out everything. You can't because like some things just have to happen in the studio, but, um, but certain things happen even improvisationally when I'm in the computer, when I'm at the computer and I'm working on a painting, there's a thing that you, you know, for instance, mathematically I might create a certain grid or plan of a diagram. I'll call them diagrams. Um, but again, I don't know diagrams to what, but like they are diagrams, right? So Mm -hmm. I'll be planning a diagram and then there's certain things that happen where, you know, there'll be an accident that happens using a certain tool. And then I'll realize that actually that 
creates a different type of space. And I'll end up using that or trying to learn how to use that accident. Sure. Um, it's not, not, not so dissimilar to sort of things that happen in the films too. There's, there's yeah. all sort of levels of improvisation that go on. But, you know, you know, as you, as you describe that, I, I think of uh, these paintings I saw in your most recent show means of escape that sort of, mm-hmm. sort of look like spider webs mm-hmm. uh, and and it's almost like the spider webs, you know, how a spider will create a pristine, you know, symmetrical spider web, and then something will happen. Maybe something's caught. Webs well, you'll break, have something drive and, through it, right? Or and then, go through it, or it'll rip, right? And then there will be these random repairs, right? And mm-hmm. you know that you know what I'm hearing kind of makes me think of of that painting and uh, are there spider webs in there <laughs> there are, there are definitely some spider webs in there i mean at the beginning of covid i found myself up in massachusetts and uh i just saw you know i was thinking about that this condensation of the city which you you know you hear people everyone from rem house to so and so talking about this like you know, that the city is the solution. And then literally we have a crisis and the city is like empty, right? So I was sort of thinking about this congestion, condensation in the city, then it going to empty, now it's back to full again. And then I was thinking about these provisional structures, these improvised structures, but highly planned, highly engineered, Mm -hmm. which are these spider webs and thinking also how ephemeral they are, but how tough they are at the same time. And I thought, as I started to sort of photograph them and found them everywhere, you know, like once you start looking for something, you can start to, you know, it's like looking for the letter S on license plates. Like you'll, you'll start to find them, you know, everywhere. So I started seeing them everywhere. And I realized that actually maybe there's something to that idea of the improvisational um, and the idea of this, other type of organism that's actually sort of also building their habitat and trying to think about survival and thinking about, um, you know, dealing with all these different predators and also thinking about their food, you know? So it was just sort of a, it was like a study for me of, of looking at another, to me that it was, I was really thinking about New York when I was making those paintings, Mm -hmm. the state of New York, the state of also time too, because it's like everything is relational in terms of scale as we talked about. So if suddenly, you know, even if you're in New York city, which was, as I said, always my Mecca, you know, if New York is turned off, like, it was during the whatever during Sandy and you had half the city off and half the city on what type of a city is that? You right. know, what type of a city is a city with no people or no, no shows and no, you know, you know, what, what type, you know, it just sort of goes to show that a world, I mean, to me, a world without culture is a world impossible to even think about. You know, and when you think about culture, it is like it is produced by a group of people moving somewhat in a random, chaotic way, moving in the same direction. Like it's 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 not possible otherwise. If you think about what's going on in the Ukraine, it's like, you know, obviously culture becomes like a footnote. Right. There's no time to think about culture. In fact, I just got an email from from uh, Kiev because they have a couple of my paintings in the collection there, and they were oh, wow. trying to figure out evacuation. Um, I've never been, but I got an email from them asking wow. if they wanted if I if if I would help discuss, you know, what the plan was for their evacuation of the museum, and. Uh, of course, I wrote immediately back and never heard from them again. Wow. So I don't know what that means. But but anyway, this th- these are all sort of modern, sort of quite, quite sort of current circumstances of thinking about the city and crisis, right? 
Sure. That's what we're all sort of thinking about. Even now, even now we're sort of in this moment of like optimism and whatever. It's still like, you know, what happened with the pandemic, no matter how much anybody doesn't want to speak about this, is it is part of climate change. That seems pretty clear. Sure. So, Sarah, you, uh, I, I hate to change the subject one more time, but yeah. you, you, have, sure. uh, you have a retrospective coming up, right? I do. I have two retrospectives. You're reminding me of it. Don't give me a headache. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there's, two, there's two. One is in Japan and one starts in Germany. And um, I tried to get them all on the same page that it would be the same show because I just thought maybe that would be better. But um, the Japanese said, no, they want to do their own show. So it's actually two different shows. One starts in January. No, no I was just going to say, does that mean there are going to be some pieces that have to go from one to the other? But No, no, they're two separate checklists. Wow. Two separate checklists. But, you know, the films, I mean, one, one reason that I started doing film to begin with, aside from taking over my own set of references and being in charge of my own, program so to speak you know like not waiting for somebody to like write about it but to actually just sort of do it in visual form like a manifesto is that you can show a film multiple places at the same time it has a it has a big advantage over a painting in that regard and then then you add in the fact that people are sort of attuned to watching moving image much more than they are uh something that is seemingly static um, but yes, they have two separate checklists, two completely different shows with two completely different catalogs, which is, that's why I say it's like, it's a little, um, overwhelming at times, but I'm super excited about doing them. One starts in January in 2023 in Osaka, and the other one is in Hamburg and it opens at the Dijkter Holland at the end of April, 2023, and then travels through Germany and Switzerland. So is there a lot of heavy lifting on your part between now and then? Yes. <laughs> yes, because as we know, curators like, uh, at least if you're living, curators like you to do, you know, they want your uh, take on almost everything, right? Uh, Which is good. I'm not complaining, but it's just like, you know, you have to, it's, it's about making the checklist and um, um, I'm just watching Seth Price walk through the 7-Eleven parking lot right now. I'm in my kitchen of the studio. Um, anyhow, it, yeah, it, I, and I, there's because I'll be involved with the books too, right. right? So I'll be. We have to come up. We have to find a lot of images of the making of the films and film stills and lots of visual material, and also make sure that like everything is compatible. Now with this whole thing of everything becoming so high res, there's tons of old things that need to get re-interpolated, right? They need to get, unfortunately. But somebody has to do this. So, I, you know, it's going to have to happen, I guess, in the studio, sort of under my supervision, I guess. Right. So, but yeah, there's two books coming out for those shows. And the title, I want to just add the title of the Hamburg show is All Systems Fail. Got it. Which they were a little bit like, oh, you know, um, when I said that title, they're, of course, like, you know, it was, it was, I think, in the middle of COVID. It was mm -hmm. like deep COVID, actually. When I say deep COVID, it was probably like early 2021. Right. Maybe even late 2020 when I titled the show. But I do like the idea of, I mean, I think it's, I, I think it's a good thing that people can't be controlled and that things go wrong. Like, I, I don't see that as a bad thing, that system planning would fail. And, you know, we uh, try as we might, we really do a terrible job of anticipating in the future. And so. Well, there were a bunch of people who anticipated this future. That's true. You know, but yes, but believing it is another story, right? Right. Um, but it's, 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 it's. it's it's definitely, there's a lot of material to deal with. There's a lot of aspects of thinking about how, yeah, I mean, 
I'm not even sure. I don't even, as an artist, I don't even want to think about how things should be structured better. You know, that's, that's somebody else's job. Right. But, but I can think about how things could be. Um, well, well, it's just, you know, that's micro versus macro, right? You know, the, you, you can't worry about as an artist, maybe how the, the grand system is designed, but you can, you know, on the micro level, how we uh, can live within that system and process it to the best of our individual abilities, right? How do we process it? How do we process it? And also as an artist, you think about how you take things over, right? Like when I think about my Midtown series or even the way I approach any sort of titling to the paintings, and the films, I think about like mapping, you know, my universe, map it, mapping it. And you, by doing that, it becomes like a form of graffiti in the sense of you're tagging it, you're taking it over, you're appropriating it. And once you take it over, like once you, once you make a film about the Oscars and do it your way, it, and you realize maybe your way is better than the actual Oscars, which it's not very <laughs> difficult to do that, right? Um, right? You actually realize that actually um, that, you know, you've changed the thing itself. You know, once, you, once you're speaking about it and, and rendering it in this other way, and it becomes shown enough and reproduced enough and discussed enough, it actually changes the original thing. Mm. The people who are in power are aware of it. They're aware that they were portrayed like that. They're aware of how, you know, they're, they're, they're highly self-conscious people. So they're, they're aware of it. And the same could be said for, you know, corporate America, which of course they're not as self-conscious at all. Still, you know, if you do, if you map out the way, you know, sixth Avenue and Sixth Avenue looked, and who sort of dominated that skyline going up Sixth Avenue in Manhattan in the late 90s or whatever it was that I did, that was, you know, that was sort of my version of the sweet smell of success. Like, you know, you have, you have this sort of panorama of the powers that be, but they're not even the powers that be now, because actually the thing is, is that these things are not, they're, they're not permanent, they're all in flux. And that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. That's a good thing that they're in flux because anything that was permanent would be a problem. Well, Sarah, I, 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 I seriously feel like I could talk to you for another hour. I mean, like we haven't even touched on your time with Jeff Koontz yeah. and, you know, I mean, just, yeah, yeah. Some, well, you know, maybe we should do another session. Uh, if you want, if you want to like get on to all of that, because of course there is a lot of material. So I'd be I'd be happy to schedule something else, and we can go sure. into and so may, maybe the beginning in New York. Yeah, exactly. I'd love I to mean, do that. maybe you want to just edit it in a way. I don't know if I went on. So you know, no, 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 no. I th this our conversation today is exactly what I wanted our conversation to be, and it was it was mm -hmm. in you know. It's like one of your films, you know, I, I set up, you know, questions anticipating, uh, you know, a, a, a line and you know, what, mm -hmm. what, uh, it, it became what it became, but, you know, I would, you know, somewhere down the line, maybe we could have another conversation and, you know, we, we that one could be about your early days in, in New York, because that, that sounds like that. a really interesting time and, um, and yeah. just how th how things have changed and how the things stay the same. Right? How things have changed and what I saw. Yeah, I think that would be that that could be quite interesting. Sure. But I appreciate your candor and your openness and just, you know, being willing to talk and talk. Is if somebody wanted to keep track of of you and your work, where's the best place to follow you, Sarah? Probably Instagram. And that's just Sarah Morris. Yeah. Awesome. I appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for asking. That's all the time we have for this week. You've been listening to ArtSense. You can find the show on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe. And while you're there, please rate the show and leave a quick review. 
Your feedback is the key to other folks finding us. And if you'd like to see images related to the conversation, read the transcript, and find other bonus features, you can go to cambia.art and click on the podcast tab. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can email me at craig at cambia.art. Thanks for listening.